Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Lannon from the Department of Biology at Keene State. This is a lecture for my genetics class. I'm going to talk about modification to Mendelian ratios, focusing on relations and ranking of alleles. The lecture goals are shown here. Please read through them in your own time. Let's go straight on and talk about the molecular, uh, the assumptions that underlie classical Mendelian inheritance patterns. Shown here is a monohybrid cross. You should be familiar from that, with that from the previous lectures, reading, and work you've done studying Mendelian genetics. Remember all those P's. So there are some assumptions that underlie these patterns, some biological realities that have to hold true in order to see phenotype ratios of 3 to 1 when you have a monohybrid cross, as shown here, which reflects an underlying genotype ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. So let's question what those assumptions are. The assumptions are that chromosomes segregate during gamete formation. In other words, each gamete has one of the two homologs within it, and that the genes laying on those chromosomes segregate along with the chromosomes. They travel with them. Another assumption that you might not have thought of before is the idea of complete dominance. So in order to see this 3 to 1 phenotype ratio, big A has to be completely dominant to little a so that in the heterozygote you see the phenotype associated with the dominant allele and nothing intermediate or different. We're going to question some of those assumptions. We're going to look at some biological examples where they don't hold true. So before we move on, we need to talk about dominance, the idea of dominance. And I need to remind you that dominance always has an underlying molecular or biochemical basis. So this slide depicts the impact of tyrosinase enzyme. Here in blue, or purple, and here is the tyrosinase enzyme, and here is supposed to be tyrosine, an essential amino acid. There's a multi-step pathway that utilizes tyrosine at one of the steps to produce melanin. Melanin is, melanin is what gives us pigment in our skin, our hair, and our eyes. If you have functional tyros tyrosinase, then you're able to convert tyrosine to melanin and you have pigment. You only need one working copy of the gene that encodes tyrosinase in order to have fully pigmented cells, which is why an individual that's big A, big A, which is shown over here on the left, will have pigmented cells. And similarly, an individual that has one big A and one little a, in other words, the heterozygote, will also have pigmented cells because this is an example of full or complete dominance. An individual that is homozygous for the recessive allele, little a, little a, will have no working tyrosinase and therefore no melanin, and they will have no pigment, therefore, in their skin, their eyes, and their hair, and we would describe them as being albino. This is an example of a phenomenon that is called being haplosufficient. One working copy of the functional gene is enough to see normal pigmentation or normal phenotype. This is also an example of complete dominance, where big A is completely dominant to little a. That is not always the case, as we shall see. So let's consider the example of the ABO blood grouping system. It's an example of something called codominance. First, let's talk about what antigens and antibodies are. So this silly cartoon is showing some foreign cells trying to invade a human body. So the immune system has a group of cells called B cells. And the B cells, and this guy over here is a B cell, one of the things that they do, really the major thing that they do, is they produce proteins that are called antibodies. These little Y-shaped structures are antibodies. We make a lot of different antibodies, and I'm not going to get into that because this isn't a lecture on immunology. The purpose of antibodies is to attach to something seen as foreign, for example, this bacterium. This is not the human. This is non-self. And on the surface of this bacterium, there will be little markers. And they're not really showing up in this silly cartoon, but trust me, they're there. There are little markers, and they are called antigens. Antigens are what bind with antibodies, and then together that binding targets this foreign cell for removal by the phagocytes of the immune system. All right, let's think about our own cells. So RBC is short for red blood cell here, or erythrocyte. Our red blood cells also have antigens on the surface of them. All cells have antigens on the surface of them. 
One of the types of antigens that are seen on the surface of our red blood cells are the H-type antigens. And the H-type antigens can fall into three groups. They can be O, A, or B. And that's why you can be blood type A, or blood type O, or blood type B. This cartoon up at the top is showing what the difference is between O, A, and B. Each of these molecules here is a sugar and the code indicates what kind of sugar. You'll notice that the O type has the same basic structure as A and as B. It's just that the O lacks an additional sugar at this position. The A has an N-acetyl galactosamine here, and the B has galactose, and that's the difference between them. This type here is essentially the H antigen. This is the H with a little bit more, which turns it into an A, this is the H with a little bit more, which turns it into a B. Now what places these onto the H antigen? There is an enzyme called a galactosyl transferase. Galactosyl transferase. And there is a gene that encodes that galactosyl transferase. One particular allele of the gene will result in a working galactosyl transferase that places N-acetyl galactosamine onto the H antigen, and as a result, you build the A antigen from H. There's another, the B allele, or IB allele, that will place galactose on instead, and then you build the B antigen. And then there's essentially a, um, a, a version of the galactosyl transferase that is, that is totally non-functional, and it's the O allele. And when it's expressed, you get a faulty protein that is incapable of adding any sugar onto the H antigen. So the H antigen remains unchanged. It looks like this up here. It's kind of a headless antigen. So what allele you have for the galactosyl transferase dictates what sorts of antigens you can place on your red blood cells. So the A allele, when expressed, produces a glycosyl transferase that converts H to A. I said a uh, uh, galactosyl transferase a minute ago, and I meant glycosyl transferase. The B allele produces a glycosyl transferase that converts H, H to B, and the O allele, when it's expressed, produces nothing. It's actually a frame shift mutation, so you get a completely non-functional glycosyl transferase. The H isn't converted to anything, so it stays H form. So what that means when we look at red blood cells is, if you are blood type A, you produce antigens that are type A. If you're B, you produce antigens that are type B. If you're O, you have these little headless antigens and you're considered type O. But interestingly, and this is where codominance plays a role, you can be blood type AB. And that means that you have both the A and the B allele for that glycosyl transferase, and you will build both types of antigens and place them on the surface of your red blood cell. That's an example of codominance. Let's think a little bit more about the human body now. The human body that is making these red blood cells has the, also the ability to make antibodies. And ideally, you don't want to make antibodies that target your own cells. So if you are blood type A, you will not make, or you hopefully will not make, antibodies that will attack your own red blood cells. You will make antibodies that will attach or will attack the other types of blood. So you will make anti-B antibodies. If you're blood type B, you will make anti-A antibodies. If you're blood type AB, you can't make either. So you won't have anti-A and you won't have anti-B antibodies in your blood plasma or blood fluid. If you are blood type O, you have these little headless antigens on the surface of your RBCs. And so you will make both anti-A and anti-B antibodies because you'll see both of those as foreign. They don't belong to you. Codominance can be defined as when two alleles of a single gene are responsible for producing two distinct detectable versions of the gene product they encode. So the phenotype in that case is not either or, it is both. And the AB blood type is a classical example of codominance. This is going to change Mendelian ratios. So before we proceed, to be sure that you're actually understanding what I just described, take a minute and make a table. Those are the column headers in the table that you should make. 
and on the genotype on the left, you should have 2 to the 3, which is 8, possible different genotypes that a human being could be with regards to the ABO system. Write the genotypes, the phenotypes, the antigen that is present on their red blood cells, and the antibodies that they would produce in their body. If you can do that, then you understood what I just covered. Let's go back to that pattern of inheritance piece. So let's consider what happens when two people that are blood type AB mate with each other and produce offspring, or what could possibly happen. So if you're blood type AB, it means you've got the A allele and the B allele. You've got both. You're a heterozygote. If these individuals mate, and you could make a Punnett square to show this, the possibilities are here, 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 and here with regards to genotype. Their blood type, which is their phenotype in this case, are going to show up like this. A quarter or 25% will be A, similarly B, and half of them will be type AB. That's a phenotype ratio. It's 1 to 2 to 1. That is not the 3 to 1 phenotype ratio that is classically seen in a single gene system where we have two possible alleles, which is what Mendel saw in his P examples. So what happens when you get the wrong kind of blood? Because this biology might be interesting genetically, but it's also very relevant medically. If you are a, if donating blood and you are type A, then that blood is going to go into the receiver, the recipient of the blood, and that recipient is going to have antibodies in their blood. If those antibodies do not match the, the antigens on the donor blood, then all is well. In other words, no binding between antigen and antibody will occur. We say no agglutination, which is a fancy word for clumping together, will occur. And that's good because the last thing you want in the human body is clumping or agglutination of red blood cells. That leads to serious cardiovascular disease. Now in contrast, if you've got a donor who is donating blood wherein the antigens on the surface of their blood will bind with the antibodies in the receiver blood, then an agglutination reaction will occur, and agglutin agglutination or clumping leads to hemolysis, breaking of red blood cells, and that will lead to serious, serious um, disease in the receiver. All right, so if you actually understand this stuff, then you should be able to answer the questions that are shown here with complete written explanations and expect to be called on to show those answers in class. Next, we're going to go on to talking about an allelic system.